Welcome to the Oral Fluid Drug Testing Pros and Cons webinar. Uh, this is Dave Walding, our product manager here at Hyorite. Uh, we're going to try and keep the presentation to 20 minutes and then open it up for Q&A uh, for about 10 minutes. Uh, Hyorite uh, is pre has prepared uh, this presentation for informational purposes only uh, and it is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Uh, if you have legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. If you are experiencing any audio or visual issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard or let us know through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. After the presentation, we would appreciate getting your feedback please take our short survey. Let us know if this session was valuable and if you have any ideas for future topics. Now your host for today's session is Dr. Todd Simo, Higher Rights Chief Medical Officer. You can review Dr. Simo's bio in the speaker folder and we encourage you to follow him on Twitter. I'll turn it over to Dr. Simo. Well, thank you very much, Dave. You know, it's my pleasure to spend this, this time with you all today, uh, talk about oral fluid as a specimen and, and really the pros and cons of this alternate specimen. So, you know, I'm always remiss that they, they put my picture on because I always tell people I'm much better looking over the phone than I am in person. So, again, somehow I'm going to have to change that picture beforehand. But, you know, what we're going to talk about today is really what is the ideal drug screening specimen? I get to ask this question a lot. Well, what specimen should I use? So let's look at that. You know, let's look at what the ideal drug screening specimen is and why potentially urine is no longer as uh, effective as a specimen as it was in the past. Then we'll talk about oral fluids specifically in terms of pros, cons, windows of detection, what positive rates are out there that you're seeing within the industry, and then return on investment. I am going to, at, at the very conclusion, uh, talk about oral fluid and what's happening from the Department of Human Health Services and the Department of Transportation Arena. So oral fluid in the upcoming uh, year or so will be an approved specimen for federally regulated testing. And then I'll make some final recommendations. So what's the ideal drug screening specimen? So back when, you know, at the beginning when people were talking about, well, let's drug screen uh, for risk mitigation, uh, since we all know that, you know, people who are illicit drug uh, screen users do cost us a considerable amount of money per year uh, based upon, you know, increased rates of workman comp injury, decreased productivity, and actually higher medical cost uh, expense. So when you look at the you know, ideal specimen characteristics, the one thing you want to do is something that's easy to collect and easy to transport. So you don't want anything that is a you know, biohazard uh, that all of a sudden needs special handling to, go, you know, to all of a sudden transfer it from the collection site to the, to the laboratory for testing. Ideally, it has to be inexpensive to test. It has to be accurate. You know, we don't want to take, you know, punitive action against someone who, who doesn't deserve it. So, again, accuracy is very, very important in this arena. You do have to look for ad adequate detection windows. So, you know, if a specimen only detects drug use for, you know, a, a very, very brief period of time, and therefore you're never testing within the detection window, that specimen really isn't all that useful. Uh, and then the next thing is it's impossible to subvert. So, you know, there's no way to, so to speak, study or game for the test. So when we look at the late 1980s, it was really determined throughout industry and in the drug testing arena that, that urine was this specimen. So if you ever wonder what a urine cup looks like from, you know, that is at collection sites every day, this is really just a picture of one. So from that perspective, Quest has been gracious enough, and I'm going to actually quote Quest, uh, Quest data quite, uh, quite a bit here, because Quest is one of the major drug testing labs in the country. Every year posts the drug testing index that basically shows you know, what they're seeing from a lab positive rate perspective within their urine program, within their you know, oral fluid program, as well as their hair program. So again, this lab is really is leading the way with you know, publishing 
publishing this data for people to, you know, to glean information from. So they started this, you know, looking at this back in 1988, where you see the positive rate was up near 14% in urine drug screen. So that's the laboratory positive rate. And you'd see year after year thereafter, it's just kind of fell. And now it's, you know, in the 4% range in 2014. So, you know, that begs the question, you know, it, you know, what's happening here? Are people just using less drugs in 2014 than they did in 1988? That's probably not the case. So why is your, you know, the urine rate decreasing so much? So when you all of a sudden juxtapose that, you know, the Quest, you know, laboratory positive data in urine and actually compare it to the National Institute of Drug Addiction uh, publishes reports. And basically these are, you know, they go out and query um, large segments of the population and ask, hey, have you used drugs in the last 30 days? Have you used drugs in the last year? Have you used drugs in your lifetime? And essentially what I put here is, according to their last published report that gave 2014 data, that the, you know, the self-reported illicit drug use in the last month has been in the 9% range and is now over 10%. So it's actually increasing, whereas the urine positive rate during the same period of time has remained flat. So it base, when the lines are diverging, you have to ask yourself, why is that happening? Well, one reason may be that, you know, people who are taking drug uh, screens have been, the, you know, companies that are drug screening have deterred people who use drugs from even applying. So that's actually the best drug test out there, the one that you had spent no money on and you realize the benefit uh, of someone not, you know, not seeking employment with you. However, subversion is also a big issue. And when I talk about subversion, this is really, uh, you know, in the urine arena, due to the specimen collection as a standard is not observed. Therefore, a person can go into the, you know, the collection site and do several different things to manipulate his or her urine to give a false negative result. And the ways that you manipulate urine are basically through adulteration. So there's actually commercially available products that you can dump into your urine and, and that adulterant then potentially metabolizes the drugs in that urine, so they'll show up as negative at the lab, will change the physical parameters of the urine, so all of a sudden the drug screening equipment doesn't work properly. So that adulteration is when the donor places something in their urine to, to basically try to confuse the drug screening equipment or change the physical properties of their specimen. The next is uh, substitution, and substitution is the drug screening term for saying, instead of giving their own urine, they gave something else. Now, whether that something else was someone else's urine, whether that something else was freeze-dried urine that they bought off the internet and reconstituted at the collection site and brought in, or whether they bought synthetic urine off the internet, um, or the last is they all of a sudden used Mountain Dew. But those type of things are, you know, they're substituting their specimen for something else. And the last is dilution. So with, you know, urine drug screening, as well as all drug screening, is really predicated upon a concentration level. And whatever you can do to dilute that specimen, the more chance you are to be negative. So these are the people that drink extraordinarily amount of water, use over-the-counter diuretic medicines, which basically force more free water into their urine. And there's actually some prescription medications that actually lead to normally dilute samples. So, you know, oral fluid is a drug screening specimen. It was really developed there, um, late 80s through the 90s. Uh, the lab that led the way is now part of uh, Quest Diagnostics, which is Lab 1 in Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, you know, led the way. And when you look at the characteristics of an ideal specimen, how does oral fluid, you know, match up to that? So is it easy to collect and transport? And it is. Uh, oral fluid as a uh, specimen is actually collected by the donor themselves, but collect 
doctor essentially just watches the donor swab his or her own mouth and then watches the donor put it in the preservative and then they seal that specimen. So the collector is really there just to to watch uh, you know watch the person collect their own specimen. So and, and it is at a very inexpensive price point if you don't have a collection site involved if you as a company are willing to collect that specimen so to speak yourself. And once it's collected, it's not a biohazard. It can be easily, you know, shipped via whatever, you know, transport, airborne express mechanism is out there to get it to the lab. From a, you know, cheap to test perspective, it is, you know, not all that expensive to test, but it is about 50% higher from a testing, um, you know, laboratory testing perspective than urine. Uh, it is a, a specimen that needs to be extracted from the buffer that it is put in. It has less amount of you know, volume than, than urine. So from a lab, the analytic uh, properties, you know, the analysis of that particular specimen is more difficult, and hence the price point is, is higher. However, if you eliminate the collection site, you essentially eliminate 50% uh, or higher of your cost. And therefore, from a cost perspective, it, it is standardly less expensive than most clinic-based, um, you know, urine drug screens. From an accuracy perspective, it is very accurate. It's essentially equivalent to that of urine. The same sort of amino assay, as well as confirmation testing being done through chromatographic and mass spectrometry is done. The analytic procedure is a bit different. Some of the equipment that they use for oral fluid based upon quantities and levels are a bit different from a laboratory perspective. But from an overall industry perspective, it is very, very accurate. Uh, for a confirmed positive result. Is there an ad adequate detection window? That's kind of the, the question. It's really a yes or no. You know, oral fluid has a very narrow detection window. It only has a detection window of up to about 24 hours to detect past marijuana use. It has a detection window of about two days to three days for nearly everything else. So is the detection window as long as urine? It certainly isn't. You're looking at urine for many of the things like cocaine and methamphetamine, that's about three days in urine, and marijuana is seven days. So it is a, you know, seven times longer. So you have one day compared to seven for marijuana. But from a you know adequate detection window, you do see quite a few positives in, in oral fluid. So it, it, it then basically supports that the detection window is actually you know mimicking drug use, and you're actually able to make an appropriate um, you know decision on that. And is it impossible to subvert? And the the question. It, the answer to that question is yes. The caveat there is if you don't follow the appropriate collection uh, procedure, and that's basically saying nothing in the person's mouth for 10 minutes prior to the test, um, it's impossible to subvert. Uh, if you all of a sudden have a you know, oral fluid donor that takes a big gulp of water right before you put the swab, you know, they put the swab in their mouth, the swab will then suck up all the water and won't truly get oral fluid, and then you'll end up generating a you know, invalid result at the lab because the lab will basically say there was really no oral fluid, you know, within the, that specimen. And your MRO in those circumstances would be reporting to you, reporting to you that that's a test canceled. So, you know, from oral fluid, you know, its big strength is really temporal relationship to use. So, you know, oral fluid is an analog to serum, which means essentially what appears in oral fluid is what appears within the blood at that period of time. Um, so that, that's why the detection windows are narrow, but you also see that it, it does have a great temporal relationship to use, and therefore there are some judgments that can be made in terms of impairment. Um, and, and that's always, you know, something that a lot of, you know, employers are looking for when they're making derogatory decisions, you know, based upon, you know, a workman compensation claim or, or something like that. 
it is not easily subverted. You know, there's really no way that you can subvert that specimen. You cannot have your wife spit in your mouth and you go to the collection site and get a specimen. You know, if your wife does that, you will essentially, you know, um, dissolve that oral fluid, digest that her oral fluid within 10 minutes and have your own oral fluid available. So therefore, there's really no subversion. You can't buy synthetic oral fluid over the, you know, over the counter off the internet and get that in and all of a sudden have that available. It, the way oral fluid works is just not possible. And then, you know, it can be collected, it, uh, you know, without a whole lot of icky factor. You know, it's essentially like watching someone brush their teeth. Um, the weaknesses are that it does have a higher cost from a laboratory perspective, and it does have a much higher cost if you all of a sudden want to use a, a collection network, like a local clinic, uh, to collect your specimen. Because clinics generally will charge you the same rate for oral fluid collection as they do for urine, and that will massively change the price point. And one of its weaknesses, it does have a relative, you know, the smallest detection window for marijuana, less, less than 24 hours. You know, so those are, you know, uh, you know the strengths and weaknesses of the spe you know, specimen. And from a, it's very sub, uh, sub, subversion resistant in regards to this, that you really can't manipulate it through adulteration or substitution, and really dilution isn't really a factor with this, so it's very uh, subversion resistant. So again, the detection windows we talked about before, you're looking at oral fluid is about two days, and with you know urine drug testing, it can go out to, for the standard five panel drugs, out to about seven days. So there is that difference. So when you look at the Quest data compared to the self-reported drug use data, and then you layer in the Quest data on oral fluid, you basically see, as we talked about before, the self-reported drug use is on the incline. You're looking at the you know, urine drug screening positive rate essentially being flat. And then what you see is the oral fluid lab positive rate is mimicking the same line as the self-reported rate. So you're actually seeing increased hits at the laboratory with oral fluid than you are with urine. So when we, you know, I looked at this as in a deep dive in fiscal year 2015 here at Higher Right, since we have a considerable amount of, you know, clients that do oral fluid and urine. And, you know, Corey, the database, and these are MRO verified positive rates. So, you know, the difference between a lab positive and MRO positive is the lab positive includes the things that people may be on a prescription medication for. So when we look at MRO verified positive, these are the ones that the MRO says that the person doesn't have a reasonable and verifiable explanation for that result, and therefore we're, you know, verifying it as positive. And when we verify it as positive, that that generally, in, in the employer's mind, is when you take your, you know, derogatory action against that particular donor. So, you know, from in fiscal year 2015, when I looked at non-regulated urine and compared it to oral fluid, the MRO verified positive rate was, uh, you know, double that of urine, two points higher. And when we looked at our average cost, so what the end consumer is using, you see at urine it's a $35 fee, and with oral fluid it was about a $29 fee on average. So that's basically, you know, when you look at cost and comparison to hits, the difference between. So you get more hits with a less expensive specimen. So how does that propagate to a return on investment? So I said earlier in the slide, you know, uh, earlier in the presentation that, you know, return on investment, what are you getting from, you know, your, your drug-free workplace program? So basically, you know, illicit drug user, if you have one on staff, is, is costing you around $14,000 per year. That number is generated through three major drivers, as I stated before. Number one, they are five times more likely to have a workman compensable injury. And as we all know, one workman compensable injury costs over $30,000 per occurrence. So workman comp injuries are costly. Number two, 
they have three times the medical care costs, so therefore they drive up your medical premiums and drive them up in a substantial way. And the third thing is, is they work at about two-thirds of their predicted efficiency. Therefore, you need more full-time employees to do a job, and they have more unexcused absences, missing over 20 days per year unexcused, which is essentially missing a whole month of work every year. So when you take those three factors together, blend them up, and apply them across all the different, you know, industries and, and personnel based upon U.S. Department of Labor statistics, the Bureau of Labor statistics, um, you know, NIDA statistics, and a variety of other government entities and researchers, you get that $14,000 per year. So when you apply that across about 1,000 drug screens a year, so you as a company does 1,000 drug screens a year uh, in this scenario. If you're using urine, for those 1,000 drug screens, you're going to spend $35,000. You're going to get 2.2% of them uh, uh, reported to you as, you know, positive, and therefore when you take that, you know, uh, you know 22 positive drug screens and apply the $14,000, you end up getting $308,000 that you save, and then when you back off costs from, you know, return, you get that return on investment of $273. Well, when you look at it in, in the, the next arena for oral fluid, you spend 29000 to save 560000 and your return on investment is about double that of urine at 531000 So you're looking a less expensive uh, you know, specimen has a much higher hit rate, and that much higher hit rate generates a higher return on investment. So, you know, that's the big utility of oral fluid specimens. If you all of a sudden look at it, you know, you get a better return on investment, and you actually get a, a huge return on investment per dollar spent. So, from a DOT perspective, what's happening? So from, you know, 2012, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has been, you know, writing rules to, to adopt oral fluid as a federally regulated specimen. According to my last conversation with the Office of Drug and Alcohol Program Compliance at DOT, they believe that rule will be published sometime in calendar year 2017. You know, this revision is really part of an a overarching revision that it will add some additional opiates uh, to the test panel, so it'll still be a five-panel test, but the opiate panel, instead of just including codeine, morphine, and heroin metabolite, will also include testing for oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, and hydromorphone. But oral fluid, it will also then be approved for, as a DOT specimen because uh, SAMHSA uh, believes that oral fluid is, you know, as accurate as, as urine and therefore can be used in the federal testing arena. So going to the final recommendation, you know, if you haven't evaluated, you know, oral fluid testing, this may be your opportunity to go out there and look at it. You know, you do have, you know, a variety of, you know, it does return a large return on investment. It does have a higher hit rate. And with a higher hit rate, it does have an increased deterrent effect. And, and that's, again, as I said before, the best drug screen you ever do is the one that you never do because people are deterred from coming, you know, who are using uh, illicit drugs or deterred from seeking employment with you. Um, you know, from this, you know, perspective, you as a company, you do have to evaluate being your own collector and really watching the person collect their own specimen because when you do use a collection site, you can do that. It just changes your price point and some of that return on investment does diminish there. And again, you know, oral fluid testing is, you know, a, a more advanced. So it's a little bit different between a 1990 TV and a 2016 TV. I'm not saying that urine is bad. There's certainly, you know, programs that urine is the best specimen. But you really, you know, if you haven't looked at oral fluid recently, I would encourage you to do so. So, you know, that really gets uh, us to the, the Q&A portion of this presentation. So I will turn it over to Dave uh, to give some of the questions. 
All right, sounds good. Thanks, Dr. Simo. So, hey, we've had some lively, uh, not exactly discussion, but a number of questions coming in, um, and we'll jump uh, jump to those. Feel free to use the, uh, I think it's the Q&A button, and send us a question. Um, uh, real quick, some housekeeping notes. Uh, Sharon, if you're able to speak, maybe you can help me address some of these. Uh, two questions. One, uh, we're getting a common question asking if the presentation will be sent uh, to the attendees following uh, and Sharon just told me she can't speak. So if you could tell me the answer, Sharon, uh, uh, will the presentation be sent to attendees uh, following the discussion? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, only if asked for presentation. All right. <laughs> I'll let you uh, I can't totally decipher what you're saying, Sharon, but... Uh, yeah, Dave, Dave, being part of these before, you know, if someone would want, like a copy of this uh, presentation or be able to get a link to, to listen to it again, uh, you know, just send an inquiry uh, to us and we'll be happy to do that. Uh, furthermore, any questions that I don't answer in the remaining time, uh, you know, I will provide an answer and then that will be routed back to you. So please give me about a week to get any of the questions questions that we don't answer, uh, you know, back to you. So, again, we appreciate all questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Simo. And Sharon did, uh, did clarify if you ask uh, during the presentation uh, for the presentation, so send us a Q&A uh, question. We'll be sure to get the presentation, uh, the slideshow out to you. So, Dr. Simo, uh, you know, the questions that have come in uh, in the kind of a lively discussion has been around uh, faking or adulterating the, the uh, oral sample. Um, one of the questions, so uh, I've got a question here from yeah, sorry, they're they're scrolling my screen pretty quickly. So Linda, Jolene, and Nanette are asking about uh, uh, adulterating. Um, Jolene asks about uh, oral clear gum. Does it does it work? Uh, does it uh, does it rid? Uh, does it work sure, to rid and I can go through that. saliva for 30 minutes? No, so certainly there's a lot of, you know, different, you know, gums. There's some mouthwashes out there that are commercially sold to, to beat the oral, you know, fluid drug screen. In my experience, I haven't uh, noticed any of those actually impacting it in, in any real way. And, in fact, many times people who have an oral fluid drug test will ask for a copy of their report because many of those, you know, so to speak, products, will give you a money-back rebate if you, so to speak, don't pass your drug test. Now, if you, the one way, you know, if you're in that industry, you know, it's not such a bad industry to be in. You get, you know, spearmint gum, you mark it up uh, 500 times, you sell it for $50, and then you tell people, chew this gum and don't use drugs for three days, guess what, you basically gave, gave them a negative drug screen and the gum was basically something to occupy your mind during that period of time because the oral fluid window is, is shorter. Plus, when you have that type of markup to all of a sudden, you know, kick back the 50 bucks minus the shipping and handling, again, it's not a bad business to be in. But uh, from that perspective, there's, there's really none of those commercially available adulterants that I've seen work in the oral fluid environment. Great, thanks. Dr. Simo, do you think oral testing uh, or urine testing is more effective overall uh, for uh, particular industries, let's say contractors? And this is a question from Annette. No, so, you know, which one's more effective? Well, guess what? Based upon the data, I would have to say oral fluid's more effective. You get a higher hit rate. You get a higher MRO verified positive rate. So from an effectiveness perspective, it's more effective. Uh, and, and I think the, the sole reason, you know, for that increased effectiveness despite the decreased window of detection is the inability to adulterate it. So, you know, 10 out of 10 people doing drugs actually actually know it. Um, they, don't, they know they're using an illicit drug and they're trying to beat the test. All of a sudden with oral fluid, it's hard for them to, so to speak, beat the test. And, and due to their addiction pattern, they are using on a daily basis. Therefore, they fall within that detection window. So, you know, from an effectiveness perspective, I would say oral fluid is more effective 
predictive than urine. When I get the question of accuracy, accuracy is another question. Accuracy has to go to is the test that you finally get valid or not, and both of them are uh, you know, essentially considered equivalents in that arena. They're both using the same kind of uh, methods to screen and then confirm the specimen, so therefore I would say both are equally accurate, but oral fluid is more effective because you'll get an increased hit rate. Okay, great, thanks. So Christina and uh, Laura and a few others are asking about the process for collecting the sample and how quick is the turnaround time? So is it instant? Uh, can it be done on site? Okay, so certainly, and I will take this as the last question and we'll field all the rest of them as I discussed before. So laboratory-based oral fluid specimens are actually, you know, our, our oral fluid testing is actually done through a laboratory, so it is collected on site. That collection process takes around two to five minutes, um, you know, and you're essentially watching the person swab their own mouth to get enough uh, you know, oral fluid on, on, so to speak, the collection device. Many of the newer devices actually have um, the, the device turns a, a, a certain color on the tip of the device to show there's, there's adequate amount of oral fluid. Um, so there is kind of a quantity indicator with them in terms of the newer samples or newer collection devices, excuse me, but you watch the person swab their mouth for two minutes and then that the donor themselves puts it in the preservative and then the collector essentially seals it with the, in the donor's presence and then sends it to the lab. The whole collection of these things, you know, from start to finish takes about five minutes. There are point of collection oral fluid devices out there. From my experience, uh, you know, they're not effective. Uh, they have very high detection wind, you know, uh, windows for marijuana or high detection levels, and therefore you don't detect people uh, at all. So the, you know, what we see from a laboratory MRO verified positive rate is laboratory-based testing at 4%. When we look at some clients doing point of collection oral fluid testing, their positive rate is 0.4%, so 10 times less. Um, so therefore, you know, I'm not an advocate of point of collection oral fluid testing. I don't believe that, uh, so to speak, the technology is there yet to give a, uh, a highly reliable test. Um, yeah, and I'm a big advocate for, for laboratory-based oral fluid testing. And the turnaround time, since the analytic process is a little more challenging to the lab, is about two days. When we see urine testing, it's about a day for a negative result. For oral fluid testing, it's about two days to get the negative result back. All right. All right, that was the uh, last question. It wraps up uh, this particular uh, webinar. We we do have a list of all the questions that were uh, forwarded. We'll get back to you as uh, quickly as uh, time permits, and we'll deliver the presentation to those of you that have uh, asked for it in the Q&A window. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. Um, let me advance the slide. I don't, it's as uh, far as it goes. All right, remember there may be a survey uh, following this, and we appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much for attending today.